Good morning, everyone. I'm just, it's Mark Crowther. I'm just gonna give everybody a second to join um, as participants load in. So we'll start in uh, just a few se seconds here. Um, I apologize if there's a bit of sound distortion with my voice, uh, which most of you won't mind. Um, the, uh, uh, for some reason, I'm having a Zoom issue and my microphone on my laptop's not working. Uh, and so I'm calling in through my phone. I apologize for that. Just give people a few more seconds to join. All right, we'll get started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. This is, um, uh, this is a, a special Chairs Grand Rounds, um, uh, which I'll introduce in a second. Uh, we have regular Chairs Grand Rounds uh, next week uh, with uh, Dr. Teresa Chan and uh, Dr. Sarah Lal presenting on use of social media and some of the uh, ways and mechanisms you can use social media to your advantage in, in healthcare. Um, uh, Teresa asked me to make sure that it wasn't an April Fool's joke and I assured her it was not. Uh, Dave, today's speaker is Dr. Dave Moyer, um, who has done a whole series of presentations for us this week. Um, McMaster has an endowed lecture series, uh, which goes by the name of the Hooker Lecture Series. Dr. Hooker was somebody who endowed a large sum of money um, come almost 100 years ago to McMaster to, to have a series of lectures which, are, which rotate between departments. Uh, and because of the plague, um, uh, medicine was able to take advantage of a department that couldn't complete organization. And so Dr. Ann Holbrook and Dr. Lahana Tavani, who are um, are the leaders of, of Dr. Meyer's visit, um, asked him to come down and, and present to us on a whole series of rounds. Uh, Dr. Moore is the uh, is a full professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa and a senior scientist uh, in the epidemiology program at the Ottawa Health Research Institute, where he directs the Center for a New Word for Me, journal, Journalology, um, he received his PhD uh, in Epi from uh, Amsterdam Medical Center, uh, and his current research foci is open scholarship and trustworthiness in research. Um, he's a heavy hitter with 700 or more publications, uh, a Clarivite analyst, uh, analytics most cited researcher in the world. Um, and I'll point out that he's one of a few from Ottawa, as, as we all know at McMaster, we have a whole bunch. And uh, he is a fellow of both the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada. So. Without further ado, um, I'll introduce David and ask him to talk today about reporting guidelines for randomized trials and systematic reviews. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Mark, today, and uh, also for the uh, honor of, of being the, uh, the, the Hooker <laughs> Distinguished um, uh, Professor. Uh, it's been a, a lot of fun to be um, with McMaster for the week. Uh, too bad that the plague's got in our way, but it's still been a, a lot of fun to interact, particularly with the students uh, and on, on Monday and, and the subsequent uh, lectures and podcasts that I've done. So um, I think one of the interesting questions was uh, today, uh, what do clinicians need to know about reporting guidelines? And um, it, it certainly caused me to think a little bit. Um, I did want to uh, put up as, uh, just a couple of disclosures uh, because I'm going to talk about certainly the, the top group and uh, just to let folks know I'm dyslexic and I don't really know much about grammar or spelling. I was not able to read till I was 12 or 13. Uh, so uh, I, even though I'm in academia, it's still somewhat of a struggle. Um, the learning objectives for today is sort of to understand the utility of reporting guidelines, uh, some essential issues, issues from my perspective that clinicians need to consider when reading reports of, of trials and reviews, and, and what you read may depend on the openness and transparency of, of the journal um, and, and not the article. And I think, you know, my first point would be that if I was giving this lecture five years ago, I probably would have said, you know, what you need to focus on is the article at hand. And what I think today is that it's really, I think there are two issues. One is a, a quite a systemic issue at the, at the ecosystem. And one is really sort of around, um, around the publisher, around the journal, around the editors, around the peer reviewers. So, you know, uh, how do you know whether it, it's a reasonable journal? Are the editors trained? Are the peer reviewers trained? Uh, so it's that sort of uh, 
ecosystem level. And then I think the, the second point is, is more about the authors and uh, whether the author, authors have been um, truthful and, and more importantly, transparent. So I, I think that's the, the first point that I would really wanna make to clinicians. I really try to put this up, uh, it's pretty long, but uh, certainly this is sort of, one of my mentors sort of said this um, a long time ago, and I think it's really, really important to remember, not from 1986, but it's really important to remember in 2021, and I'm, I'm not going to read that to you. I think you can, you can read that to yourself. And I think that what Drummond is, 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 is saying here, he was the deputy editor of JAMA, and before that was the deputy editor of a New England Journal. I think it holds true to today, which is really unfortunate. And Handy also said this um, in, in discussions um, in, in, in many places that I was with him, the whole of medicine depends on the transparent reporting of clinical trials. Uh, I would go further than that. And I would say it really depends on the transparent reporting of any type of research. And I think Drummond focused on trials because that was where he, his headspace was. And um, I did want to point out, because I, I think it may be true in McMaster, it's certainly true at Ottawa and, and, and you know, in many other places I, I'm fortunate to go to talk to. Many people think that, uh, you know, trials are published in, you know, the usual five suspects. And uh, what's important to know is that most trials, not all, but most trials are published in small specialty or subspecialty journals. So. So that, uh, you know, that's a context from, from which I, I believe is important. And, and I think that uh, sometimes um, when I'm peer reviewing articles and I see that the, you know, the authors have taken, you know, a hundred studies from, you know, the top five journals, one wonders about the generalizability um, of, of those sort of findings, given what we know that most trials are not published in these journals. And I, I think for clinicians, uh, you know, this may, may sound ridiculous, but it, clearly it's true. Uh, authors cannot adequately describe basic essential information. And here's some, uh, here's some work looking at, um, you know, 262 reports of randomized trials from oncology journals. And they're looking at essential stuff, drug name, dose, route. And, and what they find is, is, is that these authors found that, um, you know, 11% of the articles met, met these essential item. So it really wouldn't matter if you are using an intervention and you found it to be incredibly useful in the report that you're reading, but if they don't tell you the name of the drug or the device or the cognitive behavior therapy they're using, it's, it's useless. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. And so um, I think there was a beautiful editorial accompanying that paper uh, by Dancy, uh, really indicating that thoughtful consideration of reporting trial related procedures that could assist turning the best evidence into the best, best practice um, would be worthwhile. And I think that's incredibly diplomatic um, to say. Uh, I would have used a harsher language. But the point is that if you, if you don't provide the reader with transparent and complete information, it's not very useful. They can't take that best evidence and use it as, as best practice at, at the bedside or elsewhere. And, you know, I would say be careful uh, what you read. Uh, we, we know that Retraction Watch has reported um, a, a large number of COVID-19 retractions in a period of 12 months, um, including retractions from um, some of the big journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, you know, the usual suspects. And, and I think that speaks to my earlier point that we, we, we have a systemic systemic problem uh, at, at, at journal levels and publisher levels. Um, we also know that uh, there are uh, predatory uh, papers appearing in systematic reviews. And uh, the early indications are that the quality of reporting of, uh, of the COVID-19 research, which is a hyper publications for um, you know, many people is, is not what it could be. And so there's an awful lot of waste in the system, even during research on the pan and pandemic. 
Now, to my point is I, you know, if I was there in person, I would ask, you know, how many people know who this person is? Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know how many because I'm, I'm sitting here virtually. But th this is a, um, a French researcher, uh, Dieter Rouleau, and he was regarded as um, an incredibly important person in, in French science. And he heads up, um, you know, a very large uh, institute, research institute. And I think single-handedly, um, this man has had more impact than uh, anybody in uh, sort of in the room, so to speak, because he's managed to uh, convince uh, the president of France and the president of the United States that hydro hydroxychloroquine is, is a great drug uh, for um, treating people with uh, uh, COVID-19. Now, if you were to sort of look at the research uh, output that he used to promote this, what you find is, is that one is that he, he runs a journal called uh, um, Microbiome and um, several of the people in leadership positions at this journal uh, report directly to him at his institute. So um, we've done a forensic analysis uh, of his publications and um, that will be forthcoming very soon. But it, it's just speaking to my point, if you're a clinician, you can't simply worry and look at what you're reading. You have to know, unfortunately, quite a bit more about the journal that you're reading and the publisher, uh, where it's coming from. So it's not, it's not straightforward anymore. And I apologize to the clinicians in, in, in the room. Um, I, I do want to make some just sort of general comments about uh, reporting research, because I think they're important to remember. Uh, one is that, um, you know, research reports should be truthful uh, and should not intentionally mislead. And it, it, it's sort of strange in a way that it, in, in 2021, then I'm sort of chatting with you about um, responsible conduct of research. And the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors sort of say that in, in return for the altruism and trust that make clinical research possible, uh, the research enterprise has an obligation to conduct research ethically and report it honestly. And I would sort of uh, take what the ICMAJ say and say, scratch out the word clinical, and I would just say all research. And um, I think that's really important to remember that we want authors, editors, and publishers to be honest and truthful and transparent. And the, the, the other part is, is, is for you as clinicians is that the research reports, they've got to be useful to you as readers. They've got to be useful to patients as readers and, and a whole bunch of, uh, of, of um, stakeholders. Now, typically what I do, and it may not be what everybody does, is, but I always think about when I'm reading something, can I replicate easily the methods and the results if I was interested? And um, I think for, for clinicians, some of this, uh, may resonate with you. And I just briefly also want to mention a little bit about the taxonomy of poor reporting. So we have non-reporting or delayed reporting of whole studies. And really what we're getting at there is publication bias. And publication bias, uh, if we look at the Cochrane Library um, and a, a recent update of uh, uh, Roberta, um, oh, I'm forgetting her surname, but Bobby Beerer, uh, she, she's shown that actually the publication bias might be on the rise. And there are uh, other, uh, other pieces of research to indicate that um, uh, publication bias remains to be a very serious problem. So then we move from sort of publication bias where the whole study is missing to selective reporting biases or reporting biases uh, where um, we're thinking about uh, is the, the primary outcome uh, maybe changed from the protocol the uh, data analysis may be changed, and there, there may be some uh, other incomplete uh, publication and misleading interpretation and, and uh, other problems. And I'm going to go through some of these, but uh, we, we should know that the, you know, we can't lump all uh, sort of inadequate reporting in, into, a, uh, into, into the one box, that there are different types of, of uh, poor reporting. And we, uh, thinking about the, taxonomy is probably quite useful. 
And so really what are reporting guidelines? Uh, well, reporting guidelines typically uh, include a checklist. They may include a flow diagram. And um, there's usually some explicit text to guide authors in reporting specific types of research. Um, and then uh, typically, uh, even in COVID, there is a consensus process and that obviously is now online. And, and then it carefully, uh, carefully developed reporting guidelines provide authors with a minimum set of items that need to be addressed. Not the maximum, but the minimum. So uh, you can always add if you don't think a checklist is provided. I did put in, in yellow highlight um, that reporting guidelines aren't simply a group of people sitting in a room saying, you know, I think this is important. And if I think it's important, everybody, uh, we're gonna get all authors to do it. We're, we're driven by evidence to inform the selection of an item whenever that's possible. And I'm going to come and give you a, a couple of examples of that. And for those of you who are interested um, uh, in, in checklists, I, I, I would really recommend uh, the checklist manifesto. As a matter of fact, I'd probably recommend anything written by Atul Gayawandi, um, who is a, an absolutely beautiful writer. And um, I would say his principal job is, is he's a reporter uh, for the New Yorker. And his secondary job is that he's an oncologic uh, surgeon uh, at Harvard. And he's written some fantastic pieces, which uh, unfortunately I won't be able to go into today. But the checklist manifesto is very, very interesting. So I will just, give you an example of PRISMA uh, in, in terms of my previous comments. PRISMA is, is, is a reporting guideline for systematic reviews. And items, item 16A sort of asks authors to tell us uh, about the results of the search and the selection process uh, from the records or all the way through to a flow diagram. And here is an example um, where uh, I think it's really nicely put out and there's a, some text and in parentheses, they provide a, um, a flow diagram, um, which is included in the plus one article there and it gives you the URL. So we're not asking people to go to the ends of the earth. We, we think that this is a pretty basic and, but it's very nicely transparent. And just for the rest of my talk today, just a, a little note on uh, nomenclature. One is if, if we're talking about planning of, of, of trials or reviews, I'm going to talk about SPIRIT and PRISMA P, it's PRISMA for protocols. And if I'm going to talk about reporting of complete trials, I'm going to talk about consort and, and I'm going to talk about uh, um, PRISMA uh, for the uh, reporting of completed systematic reviews. So the question that you might be asking, certainly one I always ask is, um, are reporting guidelines effective? I mean, there's no point in sort of saying to you today to use reporting guidelines if it's, if it's not an effective intervention. And I think we, we do have um, information uh, that indicates that reporting guidelines are effective. So here's a, a nice randomized trial from Eric Kobo and in, in uh, randomizing uh, manuscripts to um, a consort intervention or a non-consort intervention standard to practice. And, and looking at the outcomes, we, we note that the use of consort improves the quality of reporting of the published work. Uh, here is indirect evidence from a systematic review that we've done, sort of looking at journals that endorse consort versus journals that do not endorse consort, looking at allocation concealment. And you you can see when looking through these methodological studies that, that um, those endorsing consort, uh, um, the, the reporting of allocation concealment is, is much more transparent and adequate. And, and I think both the, this is both indirect and direct evidence that um, reporting guidelines are effective. Uh, there are, is lots of other evidence, uh, uh, but I simply, you know, I don't have time to go through all of that today, and I don't think it's the essence of the talk. And um, I, I would recommend using reporting guidelines when you're reading a research study. Uh, we know uh, that, uh, unfortunately, um, editors do not encourage their peer reviewers to use reporting guidelines, and that speaks to my bigger issue of the systemic issue of, of training of editors um, uh, in, in general. Um, 
So the question would be is, um, you know, for you, again, if it's trials, what type of trial are you, uh, are you reading? Is it a two group, is it a cluster, factorial, crossover, or even a combination of these and, and others? And, and, and for reviews would be the same. It, you know, are you looking at a, a traditional pairwise review and network meta-analysis and IPD, individual patient data meta-analysis? Are you looking at a scoping review? And I think once you've sorted out what you are uh, reading, then I would really encourage you to go to the Equator Network, which is an open access uh, repository, has a library, and you could look at, for example, a consort, or there are many, many uh, extensions to consort, and likewise for Prisma or, and its extensions, protocols, and um, there's lots of other um, um, uh, study, uh, excuse me, there's lots of other um, reporting guidelines. There's uh, 454 at the moment that is undergoing a major clean. There is a very big audit going on. And my suspicion is that at the end of the audit that uh, we may be left with um, about a quarter of that, if a quarter. So, um, you know, journals, as I said, you know, they're important to think about and, um, here, here's a, a journal um, that recommends uh, the use of reporting guidelines uh, to, in, 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 to help improve the quality of reporting. So it, it, this editor of, from the archives, he was very concerned that if he um, <clears throat> used, uh, if he had a policy of recommending authors to, to uh, use reporting guidelines, as part of their um, sort of writing up and submission process is that um, authors would go elsewhere to other journals. So uh, what he did is he was very, very clever. Uh, very, very clever. He got the top 30 journals in his field and he brought them together and he got them all to agree to recommend the use of reporting guidelines at the same time. So he sort of got over the problem there of you know, if if, um, if people were submitting to the archives and they had uh, reporting guideline requirements, then they wouldn't be able to go to, you know, another journal in that space uh, because everybody was doing it. So I think uh, as clinicians, you should see, does the journal recommend the use of reporting guidelines? And then I would say, um, you are probably getting a biased sample of, of what's published and here uh, to, to to really show my point, uh, here is a, a 2020 example of um, <clears throat> German, German medical schools and university hospitals. Uh, uh, what they're doing here is they're uh, looking at protocols and looking at subsequent publication of completed uh, trial reports. And what you see is that um, the median number uh, around here is not very good. So, what it suggests is actually about 60% of, uh, of, of trials are not, are not getting published. And, and I think that wouldn't differ um, uh, elsewhere. And we are actually replicating this uh, for the uh, university intensive schools in Canada. So uh, I, I think when you're reading an article, you may not be getting the, the, the full, uh, set of information. There may be a large number of papers that you're not able to read because they're simply not published. And um, I think another question you would want to ask as a clinician is the randomization adequately described. And this comes back to my point that uh, reporting guidelines uh, such as consort use evidence to inform the selection of items whenever possible. And here is um, a, 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 a really important paper uh, from 1995, uh, indicating, I think for the first time in, in, empirically, directly, that um, shows that um, inadequate reporting uh, does influence the uh, intervention, the estimate of the intervention's effectiveness. So it influences, for example, the odds ratio uh, or, or the effect size, what, whatever that might be. So I think that's that's why we ask people to tell us in detail about randomization. Um, are you 
confident as a clinician? Are you confident of the, of the description of the intervention? And here is um, Tidier, which is a, a, a reporting guidance for reporting interventions. And this comes back to the point that I, I made earlier on, is uh, are you confident in a sense that you could replicate the intervention uh, if needed be? Uh, would that give you confidence in actually the adequate description? There's no point in saying that, um, you know, I, uh, we found cognitive behavior therapy to be an effective intervention for uh, decreasing uh, suicide ideation if, if in fact you don't know elements uh, of that intervention, could you use that in practice? Uh, I think the next question I would want to um, ask uh, it, 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 as a clinician would be, um, have patients been involved in the trial? And so, for example, we have um, Spirit Pro and, and, and Consort Pro. Are patients involved in, in thinking about the outcome that is uh, the primary outcome of other outcomes that are being used? Have they, been, uh, have they been involved in that process? And are they involved in sort of other processes in, in, terms, of the, um, uh, in, in terms of the trial uh, design? And, and I think this would also be pertinent for systematic reviews as well. Another question, um, and I think a really important question is, is uh, are the primary outcomes switched? And I've, I've mentioned this earlier this week because I think it's a very important piece of work, uh, this uh, COMPARE study. And basically what these authors did is that in the late 2015, they looked at the big journals. <laughs> Here's me going on about the big journals, but they looked at the big journals over a six week period to see uh, whether the, uh, the trials that were published, whether the outcomes, the primary outcomes were the same in the trials that were published as in the protocols. And what they found is that of the 67 trials, 58 uh, had uh, switched uh, outcomes uh, to various uh, extent. And um, I, I think, um, you know, this is yet another example of, of problems. Uh, I did want to say that um, from the evidence that we have in, in the literature, that uh, switched outcomes, spin, and other problems that I've mentioned today are, are prevalent. It, it, it's not you know, the odd trial. Um, I would say, uh, depending on, you know, if you were to take all of these sort of methodological studies together, they'd be around 30 to 40% uh, prevalence of, of these types of problems. So they're serious and, and you need to know about them as, as clinicians. So one, one way of sort of dealing with um, uh, publication bias and, 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 and reporting biases is, is registered reports. And registered reports are a relatively new concept. Uh, there are about uh, 200 medical journals that are now using registered reports, but they're very entrenched in, in other disciplines such as psychology. And a registered report is when uh, a study protocol is in a sense submitted to a journal and it's, it, it, it could be given in, in, in principle acceptance for publication. And if the, if the authors carry out the study um, as per protocol, then um, they are given a guarantee uh, of a publication and uh, that would be a, a way of ensuring uh, a reduction of publication bias and, and perhaps a reduction also in reporting biases. And I, I tend to see, to think that um, registered reports will become even more common in, in biomedical journals. Uh, SPIN, I had mentioned earlier, it's the reporting practices that distort the interpretation of results and mislead authors excuse me, mislead readers, so that results are viewed in, in a more favorable light. And I think this is a, a very nice sort of methodological systematic review of SPIN. And uh, what they show is that the highest variability in the prevalence of SPIN was present in trials and not surprising. And uh, throughout, the, uh, not, not simply at trials, but throughout. So SPIN is prevalent in, in the abstract, 
it's prevalent in, in the discussion as, as well. So uh, some of the common practices used to spin results, including uh, detraction from statistically non-significant results. So they're trying to sort of hype up uh, the fact that, uh, you know, um, something is um, at, at point uh, zero 0.06. Um, so, and, and we see this a lot. I'm sure you as clinicians reading will, will notice that quite a bit. Um, I think it's also important to think about uh, in, is there a balance in reporting benefits and harms? Um, I think typically what we see is that um, <clears throat> trials and, and reviews, uh, you know, they, they spend 80% uh, or 90% of, the, um, of their text reporting on the benefits and, and very little on reporting of the harms. And we need a much greater balance of reporting benefits and harms. Um, I would say another marker to think about is have the authors assigned a declaration of transparency and, and this is that the lead author, in a sense, typically the corresponding author, affirms that the manuscript is an honest, accurate and transparent account of study being reported. And here we see that um, uh, it, it, just an example in, in the BMJ is one of the journals, there are a few journals that have um, endorsed um, uh, the Declaration of Transparency. And, and I think that's another way to deal with this, this vexing problem of, of honesty and transparency and, and also reporting biases. So I think this is something to think about um, for clinicians. And, and my point is, which I keep repeating, this is not really about the authors, it's really about the journal. And, and in, obviously in some cases, the publisher. And um, does the journal use badges to increase transparency? Now, you, you might think this is sort of silly, um, but it, what we see is that um, it, this is an experiment uh, here of um, in psychological science uh, versus some other psychology journals. They started giving badges. And by that, I mean, is that on the, on the publication, there is a badge indicating that in this case, um, the data and methods are open. Uh, and what we see is that with the introduction of badges, just the same way as we use uh, badges uh, at times to increase appropriate behavior of children, um, we see that we can actually influence the appropriate behavior of um, uh, authors. So uh, that is not very common in, in medicine, but it might become more common. And, I think that, uh, again, there are uh, issues around what level we're talking about, the author level for badges and, and, and journal and uh, publisher level. And I, I think you, you as clinicians, you, you've just got to look at the journal nowadays, not just what you're reading in terms of the report. And, and you know, for me, you know, if I'm drugged up enough, what's my utopia? What do I think uh, we should be doing in terms of reporting? Well, one is, um, I, I think we ought to be really thinking, uh, even as clinicians, we ought to be thinking about the, the top guidelines and top uh, stands for transparency and openness promotion. And, and here you could go, uh, this is on the, uh, um, on the open science framework. You could go and have a look at this. You can have a look at the journal. Perhaps you're reading something from eLife. Perhaps you're reading something from um, the, the Journal of Cardiovascular Surgery or the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can go and have a look at the top guidelines, which I'm not sure whether my next slide is. Uh, here is just an example. Thousands of journals have signed up to top, thousands of journals. And you can go and see how transparent they are. And that may, may help you in terms of uh, what you're reading. Uh, I think that would be uh, really important to do. And um, um, do you feel confident um, in, in replicating methods, in, including the intervention in, in your practice? And here's just one example um, uh, from osteoarthritis and cartilage, uh, where they were not able, uh, they were not able to replicate the re recommended exercise interventions uh, for knee osteoarthritis. So I think this is a real problem. Uh, we're, we're not getting sufficient transparency and, and uh, I, I think this is uh, 
uh, you know, a serious problem that we need to be thinking about in whatever we're reading. Um, I would argue does, uh, what's important is does the journal practice open peer review? And, and why would that be important is because it, it, if they don't practice open peer review, you've no idea as to whether, you know, uh, somebody has peer reviewed this article in one sentence, uh, in one paragraph, in three pages, whether the one paragraph or the one sentence or the three pages, whether that peer review is evidence-based or, or whether it's based on, you know, silliness, which, which we constantly see. So I think you need to look at journals to see whether their peer review is, is, is useful for the particular argument, uh, excuse me, for the particular article that they're reading. And, and something that I've been thinking about and that I've not seen discussed in, in the literature at all is whether we can use forest plots um, um, in meta-analyses as a measure of reproducibility. So if this was a, a, a particular, a drug uh, used for a particular um, problem, would you think if you were looking at, and, and these are all trials, would you think that um, actually the, the results are replicated? Is this a, a lot of heterogeneity? And is there some relationship between heterogeneity and uh, reproducibility? reproducibility. So I think that um, you, these are things I think we need to think about even, even as, as, as clinicians, I think it's very important to be considering those. Um, a, a couple of sort of news items update. One is um, <clears throat> next Monday on the 29th, the BMJ will release Prisma 2020. They will release the updated um, reporting guideline and they'll also release the updated dated um, explanation and elaboration document. Um, <clears throat> I'll just spend the last few minutes uh, sharing with you that, that we are updating uh, Spirit and Consort. Uh, we've combined the Spirit and Consort exec executive committees and we're, um, I, I see my spelling error there. We're, we're going to combine some of the extensions into the core uh, of Spirit and Consort. And what we've selected uh, is to combine the uh, tidier, the intervention. We're going to combine Consort for outcomes and uh, Consort for harms. And we're going to combine that into, um, into a, a single checklist for both um, Spirit and Consort. We're, we're doing that at the same time. So they'll come at the same time. We're just at the very early stage of this. And of course, um, the plague has slowed us down, but so has the fact that we can't get any funding for it. And um, so I would just end by saying that, um, you know, we must continue to innovate because if we don't, I, I think it's going to become increasingly more difficult for clinicians to be confident in what they're reading. And I, I think that's all I have to say today and uh, happy to, to take some questions. Thanks very much, David. That was a tour de force and, and greatly appreciated. Um, we do actually have uh, some questions. And so I'll just read through the questions online, if that's okay, um, from Greg Pernu. Uh, the first is, since 40% of trials are not reported, how do you correct for this in meta-analysis? And that's actually an interesting question. Like, has anybody ever taught, presuming that it's negative trials that predominantly are not going to get reported, has anybody ever talked about a correction factor? Yes, I mean, I think that there are an, a number of quite sophisticated statistical approaches. Uh, one is you can obviously use a funnel plot to detect, to see uh, whether visually there is a, a, a preponderance of uh, a publication bias. There are a number of um, statistical tests that you can use. And then there are tests like uh, what we call the trim and fill, which is a test that can actually uh, correct for um, <clears throat> correct for missing studies in, in a, in a, in a meta-analysis. Now, I wanted to stress that the meta-analysis, because uh, what we know is that uh, of, if you have 100 systematic reviews, we know that only about 50 of them will include meta-analysis. So it's very difficult to actually start thinking about correcting 
for systematic reviews. We don't have analytical techniques. So it's a much more um, hazardous approach to think about that. But there are methods uh, available. And actually in the PRISMA 2020, there is a lot more detail that we're asking authors to tell us about in terms of publication bias. Thanks so much. And just for everybody listening, if you do have questions, just type them into the question and answer box and we will do all the ones that we have time for. David kindly has left a lot of time for questions, so that's excellent. Um, I, the question I'm going to just add that I've, I've been thinking about, are, are you aware of examples where a leading journal um, on on review of the of the the the, the checklist that the authors filled out um, had suspicions and rejected what uh, would otherwise have been a high profile paper um, uh, because they were concerned about the quality of the journal based on the checklist. No, uh, <laughs> I, I I mean th there may be literature published, but I'm not aware. And I, I think one of the problems here is that um, we. We're not, I'm not aware that journals are actually auditing the checklists. So we, we first of all, we know that journals vary in how they endorse uh, a consort, Prisma and other reporting guidelines. We also know that journals vary in how they implement that. So we don't really know whether there's somebody in a journal is actually looking to see, did they complete a checklist and does it checked out? Does it check out? I certainly can tell you that in, in our own research, we find many examples where the checklists don't check out. It doesn't match up. And they're simply using, they're simply saying that we used consort, Prisma, whatever, as, as a quality measure. And they're trying to fly this over the editor to say, oh, we, we use the best methods. Not necessarily the case. Now, I ha we have found the opposite. Um, in a recent um, retraction uh, of a COVID-19 paper from The Lancet, uh, we felt that if they had used RECORD, which is a reporting guideline for pharmacoepidemiology, uh, uh, that if they had used that, they would have easily picked up that there were problems with this manuscript at the outset. Um, the Lancet declined our submission but we did publish it in, 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 uh, in uh, clinical epidemiology. And it sort of shows from our perspective, it, had they used this checklist, they would not have gotten to the situation of having to retract it. They probably could have rejected it much earlier on. One of the journals I was the editor or associate editor for used required checklist submission. And it was, a, it was more of a, you no, know, did you do this? Yes or no? Not did you actually do it properly? And I, I used to occasionally drift down to the checklist and have a look through it, and it was amazing to me how badly the checklists were filled out. There were more than one occasion where people said they'd done a randomized controlled trial, and when you looked at the details in the checklist, in fact, they hadn't done a randomized controlled trial, which seems like a fundamental error. But it was made more than once, so that makes it unlikely it was due to chance. Yeah. Um, Dr. Toma asks, uh, was the French scientist penalized after his promotion of hydroxychloroquine? Um, I would say that uh, the professor is, um, people are re-looking at him and uh, certainly he's come under a, a lot of uh, barrage. Uh, uh, the French authorities are looking at the funding of his institute. So the, the, uh, there, there's nothing resolved at the moment, but people are having a very, very close look at, at his work. He is, in, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, uh, we have documented evidence. He's an anti-scientist. Uh, he doesn't believe in randomization, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think it, how long he will be able to maintain his authority running the, the Institute, I have no idea. There's certainly lots of news on him. If you type him into Google, you'll, you'll find lots there to read if you want an entertaining read. Uh, yes. Dr. Holbrook asked, we rely teach trainees to rely on access and up to date to filter only the reliable and valid research for us. They are able to deal with the principles of reporting guidelines, but are they able to deal with predatory journals or reporting fraud? I don't think so, but uh, I mean, a, a point that I really would like to make is, 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 is and, and you know, I think uh, earlier in the week, I've sort of shown quite a bit of evidence about this is that uh, not everything that's published in a predatory journal is, is fake. 
and we know that, for example, the National Cancer Institute uh, has uh, is, is the is the largest funder of research that ends up in predatory journals. It's not necessarily that the research itself is fake. It's just ended up in an inappropriate space. So I think that we, we, we can't forget that. Not, not everything in a predatory journal is fake. Unfortunately, it's ended up in a fake journal. One of the slides that David showed yesterday in his talk about predatory journals, which I think will be available as a resource if you haven't seen it, it's well worth watching, was that he showed a slide of McMaster uh, faculty who sit on the editorial boards for some of the editorial journals. And there was one of our Department of Medicine faculty there. So I dashed off an email to them afterwards and he came back with an email saying, I do not sit on this. And I said, well, what? <laughs> this, this is a factual statement. You appeared on a list that was known to be. And so I think he's going to do a little investigation to sort of whether in fact he actually does have that. Uh, uh, Dr. Sacha asked, is there a formal study looking at all these various criteria you have described and the subsequent contribution to uh, the, the, the improvement in patient outcomes, I'll say. So does all this work actually result in better quality science, which improves the outcome for patients? Well, I don't know that we've had the had outcomes looking at does it improve things for patients. What, what I've showed is a few examples of where the use of reporting guidelines, the intervention that it does in, improve the quality of reporting. Uh, does that uh, trickle down all the way to the, pa to the patients? We, we don't know. And I think part of the problem is, is getting funding for this type of research. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to get people to believe this is important research. So I, I think we need to try to get uh, funding. The, these are very good questions. Uh, I, I don't have the answer to them. And I don't think there is much in the literature about that. Thanks, Roy. For people in the audience, we have uh... Some, we have a good time for questions. So if you have questions, please type them into the question and answer box. Brian Haynes asked there, asks, um, are there legitimate, he actually used a double negative, but I think he meant to say, are there legitimate reasons for not publishing trials? And he's given some example, trial proves to be infeasible. Uh, the plague intervenes. Researchers realize there's a fatal flaw in the design or in data collection or other issues. And I guess the extension of that is if if you're doing a study and you've got as far as actually randomizing patients and exposing them to potential harm, and then you realize there is a fatal problem with the study, what would you recommend with respect to making people aware of why the study wasn't published? Well, I think, uh, you know, I use the, 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 the literal translation of published, and that is uh, making something available. And so I recognize that, uh, you know, there may be fatal flaws, problems, put it in a preprint make it available, let others judge on its utility for being included in a systematic review, being used in other ways, make it available. There, there's no reason why it shouldn't be made available. Uh, just to, I don't know if it was a, if it was a point that you made, Mark or, or Brian, uh, of course, the, the plague has really interfered with trials in a big way. And I know that McMaster do many, many trials and they'll be very aware of it. There is an initiative um, called Conserve, which is a reporting guideline for trials that have, had, uh, that have been interfered with by extenuating circumstances such as the plague. And that's at a, quite a late stage and will, will be, uh, again, will be published or submitted for publication uh, very soon. There's been a very large number of people involved in that initiative. I'm not leading the initiative, but um, I, I think there is no excuse, regardless for how difficult, problematic, badly done, for whatever reason, put it in a preprint, make it available and let others judge. Yeah, it is something you may want to just spend one second explaining what people, to pre people what preprints are, because I was surprised yesterday that people haven't um, uh, haven't had a chance to actually read about this and understand what they're good for. Sure. So preprints are a, a report of a completed uh, study. Uh, it might well be the report that you are submitting to a manuscript. There are, you put it on a, a preprint server such as Med Archive, and that is um, it, it funded by uh, CZI, which is the Chan Zuckerberg Institute initiative. 
and uh, you, want, you put it there, it's open access, available to anybody, you get a DOI. And the vast majority of journals allow uh, for authors to use preprint servers prior to or in conjunction with the submission. So uh, I will be sending a, a um, I think I sent it to Anne, but I will send it further afield, it, it, an article and some resources on uh, preprints and preprint servers. Thank you very much. That's actually something that I'm going to spend some time thinking about because, um, as you said, most journals do now accept pre journals that have, uh, articles that have been put in preprint, and it's actually a real interesting way of addressing the question that uh, Dr. Haynes just raised. Uh, Greg, uh, oh Mitchell Levine, Mitchell Levine actually said uh, with some bold in it, um, but I won't repeat the bold. Not all clinical trials uh, publications are intended to change practice based on their results. Sometimes small, weak studies are first steps in hypothesis generation. It's the readers who are failing by making it, is it the readers, it is or is it the readers who are failing by making excessive inferences from what they read and how can one address this type of problem? And I'll add a little caveat to that. You talked about SPIN. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what SPIN is and how it's influencing science as well. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think to, to Mitch's point, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, perhaps a shared responsibility of, of, of readers, of authors, of journals, and, and it depends at what stage the trial is. If it's a small feasibility study, if it's a phase one trial, or is it a, is it a phase three trial? So really, I think it really depends. I, one would need to know of, of, of more information. I think SPIN, I mean, not I think, SPIN is in a sense um, trying to distort the reality in, in that uh, making, uh, making non-significant results, uh, hyping them up, it's sort of hyping up the in intervention. And uh, we, I don't think that we've looked at, uh, I'm not aware of research that has looked at SPIN in, for example, feasibility studies that maybe Lahana would know, but certainly in phase three trials, uh, SPIN, SPIN has been detected, SPIN has been detected in systematic reviews. Uh, it, it's really, it's typing up the reality is, is how I would define it. I sent you an email during your talk. There's a student who I met as a Bachelor of Science student of McMaster who's now a first year medical student in Ottawa who's been doing some work with me looking at spin in um, venous thromboembolism because the venous thromboembolism literature was largely for its first 40 years driven by surrogate outcomes and uh, has recently switched over to clinically relevant outcomes. And that, that's kind of a flavor of that in that there's an awful lot of spin with surrogate outcomes to overcome the limitations when you don't have clinically relevant outcomes. Yeah, great point. Uh, the last question we have here is from Greg Kernu again. Um, can you comment on class effect versus specific drug in a class uh, when some drugs work and others do not? So again, how do you, I guess if you're doing a systematic review and it's about statins, how do you tell if it's about statins, about resuvastatin? And is there any science to being able to hone that down from looking at a systematic review? I think the, the answer that I would give is that you can uh, perhaps do subgroup analysis and some sensitivity analysis. You could perhaps use some meta regression uh, to try to uh, uh, sort that out a little bit uh, further. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions. I'll, I'll just, so I, I, I'll, we'll, we'll finish a bit early today. So David, I'd really like to thank you for a heroic trial by fire of multiple presentations this week. I don't think we normally subject the visiting professors to this many talks. Um, uh, they've been, I think, extraordinarily helpful and illustrate something which many of us had, illustrated many things which many of us hadn't actually heard before. The student session was, was particularly good. Um, so I'd like to thank you uh, and congratulate you on a great series of lectures uh, on behalf of both myself, the chair of the Department of Medicine, uh, and also and, and very importantly, on behalf of McMaster University, um, the Department of HEI, uh, and the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences. Thanks very much for your time and for really doing a lot, of, a clear, clearly a lot of work to provide outstanding quality um, presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation, and uh, I, I really, I really enjoyed my 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 time there. It was is is really great. It's a pity I can't be there in person, but perhaps another time. Thanks very much. We'll see you later. Take care. Bye bye.